After the execution Pierre was separated from the rest of the prisoners and placed alone in a small, ruined, and befouled church. Toward evening a non-commissioned officer entered with two soldiers and told him that he had been pardoned and would now go to the barracks for the prisoners of war. Without understanding what was said to him, Pierre got up and went with the soldiers. They took him to the upper end of the field, where there were some sheds built of charred planks, beams, and battens, and led him into one of them. In the darkness some twenty different men surrounded Pierre. He looked at them without understanding who they were, why they were there, or what they wanted of him. He heard what they said, but did not understand the meaning of the words and made no kind of deduction from or application of them. He replied to questions they put to him, but did not consider who was listening to his replies, nor how they would understand them. He looked at their faces and figures, but they all seemed to him equally meaningless. From the moment Pierre had witnessed those terrible murders committed by men who did not wish to commit them, it was as if the mainspring of his life, on which everything depended and which made everything appear alive, had suddenly been wrenched out and everything had collapsed into a heap of meaningless rubbish. Though he did not acknowledge it to himself, his faith in the right ordering of the universe, in humanity, in his own soul, and in God, had been destroyed. He had experienced this before, but never so strongly as now when similar doubts had assailed him before. They had been the result of his own wrongdoing, and at the bottom of his heart he had felt that relief from his despair and from those doubts was to be found within himself. But now he felt that the universe had crumbled before his eyes and only meaningless ruins remained, and this not by any fault of his own. He felt that it was not in his power to regain faith in the meaning of life. Around him in the darkness men were standing and evidently something about him interested them greatly. They were telling him something and asking him something. Then they led him away somewhere, and at last he found himself in a corner of the shed among men who were laughing and talking on all sides. Well, then, mates. Dot. Dot. That very prince who. Dot. Dot. Some voice at the other end of the shed was saying, with a strong emphasis on the word who. Sitting silent and motionless on a heap of straw against the wall, Pierre sometimes opened and sometimes closed his eyes. But as soon as he closed them he saw before him the dreadful face of the factory lad especially dreadful because of its simplicity and the faces of the murderers. Even more dreadful because of their disquiet and he opened his eyes again and stared vacantly into the darkness around him. Beside him in a stooping position sat a small man of whose presence he was first made aware by a strong smell of perspiration which came from him every time he moved. This man was doing something to his legs in the darkness, and though Pierre could not see his face he felt that the man continually glanced at him. On growing used to the darkness Pierre saw that the man was taking off his leg bands, and the way he did it aroused Pierre's interest. Having unwound the string that tied the band on one leg, he carefully coiled it up and immediately set to work on the other leg, glancing up at Pierre. While one hand hung up the first string the other was already unwinding the band on the second leg. In this way, having carefully Removed the leg bands by deft circular motions of his arm following one another uninterruptedly, the man hung the leg bands up on some pegs fixed above his head. Then he took out a knife, cut something, closed the knife, placed it under the head of his bed, and, seating himself comfortably, clasped his arms round his lifted knees and fixed his eyes on Pierre. The latter was conscious of something pleasant comforting, and well-rounded in these deft movements, in the man's well-ordered arrangements in his corner, and even in his very smell, and he looked at the man without taking his eyes from him. You've seen a lot of trouble, sir, eh? The little man suddenly said. And there was so much kindliness and simplicity in his sing-song voice that Pierre tried to reply, but his jaw trembled and he felt tears rising to his eyes. The little fellow, giving Pierre no time to betray his confusion, instantly continued in the same pleasant tones. Eh, lad, don't fret, said he, in the tender sing-song caressing voice an old Russian peasant women employ. Don't fret, friend, suffer an hour, live for an age. 
That's how it is, my dear fellow. And here we live, thank heaven, without offence. Among these folk, too, there are good men as well as bad, said he, and still speaking, he turned on his knees with a supple movement, got up, coughed, and went off to another part of the shed. Eh, you rascal! Pierre heard the same kind voice saying at the other end of the shed. So you've come, you rascal! She remembers. Dot. Dot. Now, now, that'll do. Single quote. And the soldier, pushing away a little dog that was jumping up at him, returned to his place and sat down. In his hands he had something wrapped in a rag. Here, eat a bit, sir, said he, resuming his former respectful tone as he unwrapped and offered Pierre some baked potatoes. We had soup for dinner and the potatoes are grand. Single quote. Pierre had not eaten all day and the smell of the potatoes seemed extremely pleasant to him. He thanked the soldier and began to eat. Well, are they all right? Said the soldier with a smile. You should do like this. Single quote. He took a potato, drew out his clasp knife, cut the potato into two equal halves on the palm of his hand, sprinkled some salt on it from the rag, and handed it to Pierre. The potatoes are grand. He said once more. Eat some like that. Single quote. Pierre thought he had never eaten anything that tasted better. Oh, I'm all right, said he, but why did they shoot those poor fellows? The last one was hardly twenty. Single quote. T.S. is T.C. Dot. Dot. Exclamation mark. Said the little man. Ah, what a sin. Dot. Dot. What a sin. He added quickly, and as if his words were always waiting ready in his mouth and flew out involuntarily, he went on. How was it, sir, that you stayed in Moscow? Single quote. I didn't think they would come so soon. I stayed accidentally, replied Pierre. And how did they arrest you, dear lad? At your house? Single quote. No, I went to look at the fire, and they arrested me there, and tried me as an incendiary. Single quote. Where there's law there's injustice put in the little man. And have you been here long? Pierre asked as he munched the last of the potato. Aye. It was last Sunday they took me out of the hospital in Moscow. Single quote. Why, are you a soldier then? Single quote. Yes, we are soldiers of the Apsherin Regiment. I was dying of fever. We weren't told anything. There were some twenty of us lying there. We had no idea, never guessed at all. Single quote. And do you feel sad here? Pierre inquired. How can one help it, lad? My name is Platons, and the surname is Karatev, he added, evidently wishing to make it easier for Pierre to address him. They call me, Little Falcon, in the regiment. How is one to help feeling sad? Moscow, she's the mother of cities. How can one see all this and not feel sad? But the maggot gnaws the garbage, yet dies first. That's what the old folks used to tell us, he added rapidly. What? What did you say? asked Pierre. Who? I. said Karatev. I say things happen not as we plan but as God judges, he replied, thinking that he was repeating what he had said before, and immediately continued. Well, and you, have you a family estate, sir? And a house. So you have abundance then. And a housewife. And your old parents, are they still living? He asked. And though it was too dark for Pierre to see, he felt that a suppressed smile of kindliness puckered the soldier's lips as he put these questions. He seemed grieved that Pierre had no parents, especially that he had no mother. A wife for counsel, a mother-in-law for welcome, but there's none as dear as one's own mother. Said he. Well, and have you little ones? He went on asking. Again Pierre's negative answer seemed to distress him, and he hastened to add. Never mind. You're young folks yet, and please God may still have some. The great thing is to live in harmony. Dot. Dot. Single quote. But it's all the same now, Pierre could not help saying. Ah, right, my dear fellow. Rejoined Karatev, never decline a prison or a beggar's sack. Single quote. 
He seated himself more comfortably and coughed, evidently preparing to tell a long story. Well, my dear fellow, I was still living at home, he began. We had a well-to-do homestead, plenty of land, we peasants lived well and our house was one to thank God for. When father and we went out mowing there were seven of us. We lived well. We were real peasants. It so happened. Dot. Single quote. And Platon Karatev told a long story of how he had gone into someone's copse to take wood, how he had been caught by the keeper, had been tried, flogged, and sent to serve as a soldier. Well, lad, and a smile changed the tone of his voice, we thought it was a misfortune but it turned out a blessing. If it had not been for my sin, my brother would have had to go as a soldier. But he, my younger brother, had five little ones, while I, you see, only left a wife behind. We had a little girl, but God took her before I went as a soldier. I come home on leave and I'll tell you how it was, I look and see that they are living better than before. The yard full of cattle, the women at home, two brothers away earning wages, and only Michael the youngest, at home. Father, he says, all my children are the same to me. It hurts the same whichever finger gets bitten. But if Platon hadn't been shaved for a soldier, Michael would have had to go. Called us all to him and, will you believe it, placed us in front of the icons. Michael, he says, come here and bow down to his feet. And you, a young woman, you bow down too. And you, grandchildren, also bow down before him. Do you understand? He says. That's how it is, dear fellow. Fate looks for a head. But we are always judging. That's not well, that's not right. Our luck is like water in a dragnet. You pull at it and it bulges, but when you've drawn it out, it's empty. That's how it is. Single quote. And Platon shifted his seat on the straw. After a short silence, he rose. Well, I think you must be sleepy, said he, and began rapidly crossing himself and repeating. Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Saint Nicholas, Frolla and Lavra. Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Saint Nicholas, Frolla and Lavra. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. He concluded, then bowed to the ground, got up, sighed, and sat down again on his heap of straw. That's the way. Lay me down like a stone, O oh God, and raise me up like a loaf, he muttered as he lay down, pulling his coat over him. What prayer was that you were saying? asked Pierre. Eh? murmured Platons, who had almost fallen asleep. What was I saying? I was praying. Don't you pray? Yes, I do, said Pierre. But what was that you said? Frolla and Lavra. Single quote. Well, of course, replied Platon quickly, the horses, saints. One must pity the animals too. Eh, the rascal. Now you've curled up and got warm, you daughter of a bitch. Said Karatev, touching the dog that lay at his feet, and again turning over he fell asleep immediately. Sounds of crying and screaming came from somewhere in the distance outside, and flames were visible through the cracks of the shed, but inside it was quiet and dark. For a long time Pierre did not sleep, but lay with eyes open in the darkness, listening to the regular snoring of Platon who lay beside him, and he felt that the world that had been shattered was once more stirring in his soul with a new beauty and on new and unshakable foundations.